This is the fourth and final part of the fiber channel videos. Here you'll learn about redundancy and multipathing. Servers access to their storage will pretty much always be mission critical for that company. So the system should be built with no single points of failure. Redundant fiber channel networks will be put in place and they're known as Fabric A and Fabric B, or they can also be known as SAN A and SAN B. Each server and storage system host will be connected to both fabrics with redundant HBA ports. So that gives them two possible paths at least to get to each other. Fiber channel switches distribute shared information to each other, such as the domain IDs, the FCNS database, and zoning, as you learned in the earlier lectures. If an error in Fabric A was able to propagate to Fabric B, or vice versa, this would bring down both fabrics and drop the server's connection to their storage. So it's really important we don't want a problem on both sides of the fabric. So for this reason, switches in the different sides of the fabric are not cross-connected to each other. Both sides of the fabric, fabric A and fabric B, are kept physically separate from each other. The end hosts, however, are connected to both fabrics so that both paths are available to them. So you can see that in the diagram here. We've got fabric A on the left and we've got fabric B on the right. And I've signified by the big red line down the middle here that switches on fabric A and fabric B are not connected to each other. They're kept completely physically separate, so that stops any information propagating from one side to the other. You can see that our storage system and our server through the endpoints are connected to both fabrics, and that gives them the two possible paths in the example diagram here. But wait. Here, in the previous slide, there's a single point of failure again, which is the storage system controller. That's a single controller there. We don't want a single controller. We're going to want to have redundancy there as well. So we're going to have at least two controllers, so it's actually going to look like this. So you can see that controller 1 is connected to both fabric A and fabric B, and controller 2 is also connected to fabric A and fabric B. Controller 1 and controller 2 are part of the same storage system, and they provide redundancy for each other at that level. So when we configure our zoning on our switches, looking at the fabric A switches first, we are going to configure a zone for server one. So I've called it zone name server one and the member alias is S1A for server one HBA port A. And on my fabric A side, it's connected to both controller one on HBA one and controller two on its HBA one. And the server is able to connect to both of those controllers through fabric A. So in my zone, I add server 1A, controller 1A, and controller 2A to give the server to the storage access to the storage system over both of those paths. I also have server 2 as well, which is going to be configured in a similar fashion. So server 2A is able to connect to controller 1A and controller 2A. And then I group both of those zones into the zone set that's going to be replicated across all the switches in Fabric A. And obviously on the Fabric B side, it's going to be similar. Server 1 can also get to its storage through the Fabric B path as well. So S1B is allowed to connect to controller 1B and controller 2B. I put that into a zone. I also do the same thing for server 2. So there's a server 2 zone where S2B is allowed to connect to controller 1B and controller 2B. And then finally, on my zoning side, I put that into a zone set for Fabric B. So that is my zoning done. I also need to configure my LUN masking on the storage system as well. So I'm going to create a LUN for server 1, and I also create a LUN for server 2. For the LUN masking, for the LUN server 1, S1A and S1B are both in server 1, so they are both allowed to connect to that LUN. 
and for the server 2 one, S2A and S2B on server 2 are allowed to connect to that. So that is my zoning and my LUN masking completed. Okay, next thing to talk about is target portal groups. All of the ports in the storage system which initiators can access for storage through are added to a target portal group, a TPG. And in our example, on the storage system, ports controller 1A, 1B, 2A and 2B. So all of the ports in the storage system are added to a target portal group. What you can do with target portal groups is if you had one set of servers that you wanted to connect to some ports on the storage system and a different group of servers that you wanted to allow like to connect to on a different set of ports on the storage system, then what you would do is you would create two different target portal groups on your storage system. You'd maybe do that for security or for performance. Next thing is a Lua, which is asymmetric logical unit assignment. And Lua is used by the storage system to tell the clients which are the preferred paths for them to connect on. Direct paths to nodes owning the LUN are marked as optimized paths and other paths are marked as non-optimized paths. So let's see what that means. So in our example here, you can see that the LUN for S1 is owned by controller 1. Server 1 can get there via controller 2 as well because it's connected to it as well but the most direct or the optimized path is going through controller one because it's the controller that actually owns those disks. So to see our optimized paths, to hit controller one, server one can go through the fabric A side and land on controller 1A. So that's an optimized path. It can also get to controller one by going through fabric B. So it can go through fabric B and hit controller one B. So there's two possible optimized paths there. The non-optimized paths are going through controller two. So we can reach controller two through fabric A. We can also reach controller two through fabric B. So there's four paths in total, but server one has got to get to its storage. There's two optimized paths that land on controller one. So a Lua will tell the client, these are your two optimized paths and these are your two non-optimized paths. So server one will learn that information from the storage system through the use of a Lua. Okay, on to multipathing now. So during the process login we covered in the last lecture, the initiator, that's our server in our example, will detect ports available to connect to their storage on in the target portal group and on Lua will tell it which are the preferred paths. Multipathing software on the initiator will then choose the path or paths to take to the storage. And typically it's going to take the optimized path. All popular operating systems, so Windows, VMware, everything else, Linux, they've all got multipathing software which supports active active or active standby paths. So if the storage system, so if the server has learned the two optimized paths from Alua, then typically what will happen is you can do active active load balancing over those two optimized paths to get to the storage system. You could also do active standby as well, where it takes one and if that path goes down, it fails over to the standby. The client will automatically fail over to the alternate path if the one it is using fails. And this all happens on the client. So the client learns about the paths it can take to get there. And then it's the client itself, the initiator, that decides which paths it's going to take. And it uses software on the initiator to do that. So you can see the example here. This is a screenshot from QLogic SAN server. QLogic are a popular manufacturer of HBAs. And you can use SAN Surfer as your HBA management software on there. And you can see here that the client knows really everything about the fiber channel network. You can see there's a network diagram here and it can see the fiber channel switches and it can see the storage as well. So the client learns everything about how it can get to its storage. And then you can configure in the software here wherever you want it to be active active or active standby. 
So client connectivity to SAN storage is fundamentally different to how Ethernet networking works. In Ethernet networking with normal IP networking, all the routing and switching decisions are handled by the network infrastructure devices, your routers and your switches. But in SAN storage, multipathing intelligence is enabled on the client end host. So it's completely different. As far as networking goes, with normal IP, it's handled by your network infrastructure devices. But with SAN, there's much more intelligent on, intelligence on the actual clients themselves. In Fiber Channel, the initiator will automatically detect the available paths to its storage through the floggy, ploggy, and PRLI processes that we covered here. Multipathing software on the initiator will then choose which path or paths to use. Okay, so that's it for Fiber Channel. We'll cover FGOE, Fiber Channel over Ethernet next, and then we'll have a demo in the lab.